thanks for joining us for this edition of Health and Family. I'm Shay Dawn Burgess, and I will be your host for the next 30 minutes. Now, you know, from time to time, I like to give out a question for us to think about for some of our programs. Today's no different. So here's the question. Can you imagine not having your lungs to breathe? Unfortunately, there are some folks out there that are dealing with that dilemma. So what can we do to keep our lungs intact? Helping to answer that question is Dr. Chris Vosca, who is a clinical oncologist. He is the medical director and radiation oncologist at the Bermuda Cancer and Health Center, as well as a clinical oncologist at the King Edward VII Memorial Hospital. He is, well, he is also an affiliate member of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and a consultant at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. What an impressive resume. We welcome you, Dr. Fosker, to Health and Family. Thank you very much. So we're going to start off basic as we always do. Let's define lung cancer. Yeah. So. Cancer, as a lot of people know, too many people know, unfortunately, is a really challenging diagnosis, a really challenging condition. And biologically, what cancer is, is when cells in the body lose control. So the body's supposed to be in complete control of what everything's doing. And cancer comes about when it's, things start to grow too quickly or start to grow out of control. And so what lung cancer is, is when that happens within the lungs. So as most people know, you've got two lungs, one either side, and they're there to help you breathe, a very basic function. Mm -hmm and cancer can develop in any part of either of those lungs and that's what we call lung cancer. So are there different types of lung cancer? Yes, so cancer gets defined by the cells that it grows out from and within the lungs there's a number of different types of cells. Often if you're reading or if you're looking on the internet you'll notice that they divide it into small cell lung cancer and then non-small cell lung cancer and probably for the last 50, 60 years that's been the very simple divide and the reason main reason those are being divided because they behave differently and they're treated differently. Now, over the last five, ten years or so, we can dig much more deeply into the cancers and look at some of their molecular markers so you can work out mm. what mutation happened to cause that cancer. So there's probably now, you could almost say, 20, 25 different types of lung cancer, mm. depending on their mutation makeup and how they behave, which has really changed how we approach things over the last ten years or so. Now, we, most of us know that smoking is a big factor in, in causing lung cancer. How does, how does it actually happen, though? You're, you're smoking, and then what actually happens with the lungs? So smoking causes mutations. So as you smoke, the smoke gets inhaled, and it goes from the front here, from your mouth, down your throat, down into your lungs. And smoking actually drives as many as 15 different types of cancers. But the, ones it has, the one it has the biggest impact on is lung cancer. Mm. So we think between 80 and 90% of lung cancers happen because of smoking. So it's a big concern, a big risk. Mm. As the smoke goes into your lungs, it has lots of nasty chemicals, um, lots of carcinogens is what we call them, chemicals that can cause cancer. Mm. And they cause mutations. Uh, tobacco, tobacco? Yeah, yeah, so the tobacco, the nicotine, mm -hmm. all of it as it goes through the lungs, it damages those individual cells. And as those mutations recur and repeat, it's harder and harder for the body to repair them. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the longer you smoke, the more you smoke, the higher the chance that one of those mutations is not repaired by the body, by the body's immune system. And then that mutation starts to grow. And then that's what the cancer starts from. So they think if you smoke, a pack a day for a year, at the end of that year, you'll end up with 150 new mutations within the cells of your lungs. Wow. And there's a pretty high chance that one of those mutations will eventually drive along and turn into a cancer. Okay. So that, that's usually cigarettes, correct? Yeah. So yeah. would this go for uh, cigars as well as um, pipes and things yeah. of that nature? All forms of smoking um, risk lung cancer. Obviously, Sometimes with pipes and cigars, you don't tend to take the smoke down quite as far. So they've actually got a higher risk of some of the throat cancers or some of the oh, oral cancers. Okay. Um, but it's that whole smoke process. Wherever it goes into the body, it runs the risk of causing cancers. But any kind of smoking um, can, well, does increase the risk of lung cancer. All right. So what are some risk factors that increase um, your chance of getting lung cancer? Besides, we know smoking is definitely one. So smoking is the main one. Oh. And it's one of the interesting parts of lung cancer, but also one of the most challenging parts. So it's the one cancer where we know that 90% of those cancers are caused by something that we could stop. Mm. You know, smoking is a horrible addiction. It's a challenging thing. If you end up starting to smoke, it's very hard to stop. Mm. But it is something reversible and it's something controllable. 
And lung cancer is different from any other cancers. Most of the other cancers you think about, your breast cancers and your prostate cancer, there's an element of unknown about why they come around. But with, prost with lung cancer, it's 80 to 90% are caused by people who smoke on themselves. Mm -hmm. And then 10 to 20% is caused by secondhand smoking. Wow. So you don't necessarily have to have smoked yourself, but you can have that passive smoking, secondhand smoking, sidebar smoking, it's got lots of different names, but oh. that's the s second most common cause of lung cancer. Okay, that was actually one of my questions. Can secondhand smoke cause? Yeah. A non-smoker, and that, that is, you said, 10 to 20 percent? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then the last 5 percent or so, there's a few random lung cancers that we don't understand why they've started. You can go thoroughly back through someone's life and realize they've had no real exposure to smoke. But then you can have other work-associated things, asbestos, um, arsenic, asbestos. they're known to cause cancers, much less so than smoking. But it's with lung cancer, it is really just about the smoking. If we can reduce the number of smokers, if we can help people who do smoke quit, if those who do smoke can move away from people who don't smoke, all of those things can reduce the cancer burden because lung cancer is one of the more challenging cancers. I'm so. just thinking of a married couple who have been married yeah. for years and the wife doesn't smoke and the husband does, and nine yeah. times out of ten, the wife ends up with the second hand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're really hard, hard cases to hear. So, um, so we, we can establish that smoking definitely is, is a factor. Yeah. You know they're, they're advertising or promoting the, the non-smoking, those cigarettes, the, I don't know what they're called, the... Um, E-cigs or vapors or vapes, yeah. Would, would you recommend that or does that have also an impact? It's still early days, so I know they've been around for 10, 15 years yeah. now, yeah. Um, but in kind of medical science we still regard that as quite new. If you look at the research that has been done on them, they're definitely better than smoking. Okay. Ideally, you just want someone to stop. One of the hard things about smoking is the nicotine addiction. That's the part of the cigarette or whatever you're smoking. That's the part that really makes it hard for you not to say yes to another one. So with the vapors, with the e-cigarettes, you do get that nicotine replacement. You don't get the, the tobacco. You don't get the inhalation of the smoke. So they're definitely better, and there's science coming through to say they're better. What people don't quite understand about them is are they going to cause other harm? further down the line just by the nature of the addiction to the nicotine and the other ways that they're being vaporized into your system. So if you look at all this smoking cessation advice, it's your best to completely stop by whatever mechanism works for you. Turkey, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And if, but if you're struggling to stop, stepping down to an e-cigarette is probably better than, it's definitely better than carrying on smoking. So here locally, do we have places, uh, I know in the States they have, um, the patch and so forth. Do we yeah. advocate for that here? Yeah, the... yeah. so there are smoking cessation groups. Uh, the best thing to do if you, if you want to try and squit, quit, which you should want to try and do, is to talk to your GP about it, talk to your local doctor. Um, there's a number of different groups. I know the hospital run one, some of the GPs run one, the Open Airways helps advocate for smoking cessation. Um, and it's a really useful tool for people to be able to reduce how much they smoke and then eventually stop. So what are some signs of lung cancer that one can look out for and maybe get concerned and, and go to their GP? It's one of the challenging things with lung cancer, that it often grows silently. Mm. You don't have much feeling in the middle of your lungs. So if the cancer's growing in the middle or the outside, it's often quite big and quite advanced before you feel anything. But the things to keep an eye out for, um, if you become breathless, so as we were saying at the start, how important breathing is, and if you notice that your breathing becomes more difficult, that's something to talk through, again, with your GP, with your local doctor. Mm -hmm. It can be a whole plethora of different things, lots right. of much less nasty things than lung cancer. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the signs that a GP may say, OK, we need to look into things more deeply. Uh, it can be a cough. That's one of the persistent more common. Cough, yeah, a yeah. persistent cough. If a con cough comes out the blue and it doesn't go away, again, another really good reason to go and talk to your GP about mm -hmm. it. It can be more general things. Um, so you can be losing energy, you can be losing weight. They're the really worrying signs. So if you're there, you're not trying to diet um, and you're checking your weight every now and then and you realize it's going down for no reason whatsoever. Again, really good reason to go and talk to your GP about it. It could and be, too, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So particularly anyone who is a smoker and has had a long smoking history, those symptoms, those signs worry most doctors. So do doctors have a, some type of instrument to test for lung cancer? So that It tends to be a series of tests. You kind of work your way up, mm -hmm. um, looking at general things. So you might choose to do an x-ray, just an x-ray of the lungs, if there's certain types of symptoms. You might choose to do a CT scan. So 
CT scans are kind of the mainstay of the first step of the diagnosis because you get a picture of what the lungs look like. It's ebbed and flowed over the last 20 years where they've been recommended to do CT scans or not to look for lung cancer because CT scans in themselves have a small dose of radiation and so you have to think about how you're doing these things properly. That cause? Shouldn't do. Um, but there was a big spate in the 80s in the US of doing CT scans for just about everything and they worked out that it has about a 1 in 10,000 chance of causing the cancer itself. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't just be doing them without much thought. But now CT scans can be done with much lower dose. Um, so there's a new thing called a low dose CT scan of the chest, which is now in the US and certainly in some certain parts of the UK, they're looking at using that as a screening tool for lung cancer. So trying to get people to go through more regular tests, more regular scans mm -hmm. to try and pick up lung cancer early. Okay. So I wanted to talk about stages because most, yeah. most um, cancers, they do come in stages, stage one. Does this apply here in yeah. lung cancer? Yeah, so lung cancer has the traditional staging of one to four. Um, okay. One being the earliest you can find it, so just a small little lump of cancer within the middle of the lung somewhere that hasn't moved at all. Going up to stage four, where the cancer has left the lungs and spread to other parts of the body. Okay. Um, and the treatment from stage one, two, three, and four, it's, it's different every stage of the way, every step of the stage. Um, and so it's quite hard to just say there's one treatment for lung cancer. Um, if you have an early stage lung cancer, you've got a good chance of being cured as long as it's picked up early. And that's why the relevancy of your question is what should we be looking out for? What can we do to reduce our risk? Because if you find it at a stage one, either with st surgery or very precise radiation called stereotactic radiation, there's a very good chance that the cancer gets cured. When you get to the other end, the stage four, stage four lung cancer is one of the most challenging conditions to treat. It can grow very quickly. It can affect all of the body. So because it's moved out of the lungs, it often affects the liver, it can affect the bone, it can affect the brains, and it can be really, really difficult. And the mainstay of that treatment is the other end, so it tends to be chemotherapy or immunotherapy, to try and control the cancer. Because once it's gone beyond a stage three into a stage four, mm -hmm. you can't cure it anymore. And that's when it's really tough. Is it very painful for the patient? Shouldn't be. Actually, um, again, a common question, and lots of people worry about that, and actually pain is something to fear. Um, lung cancer, when it spreads, or even within the lungs, doesn't tend to cause pain. If there is pain, it can be well managed. That's the importance of involving the, the palliative care services, the palliative care doctors, um, because they're very good at working alongside oncologists to control the symptoms while we're trying to manage the disease. It tends to be a big team effort when it comes to lung cancer. Uh -huh. So we're going to pick up with that when we come back. We're going to take a break right now. We'll be right back and continue our conversation with Dr. Fosker. Healthy people and healthy communities. Move more, Bermuda. Physical activity is good for you, so shake it up with walking or running. Take the stairs. Tennis. And don't forget sunblock and fluids. Basketball. It's a slam dunk. Golf. Leave that cart behind. There's something out there for fun, for health, for you. Move more, Bermuda. A message from the Department of Health. And we thank you for coming on back. You're uh, tuned in to Health and Family. And with me today is Dr. Fosker, Dr. Chris Fosker. And he's talking to us about lung cancer. And so uh, we, we, last, we talked about the pain yeah. concept or aspect of it and um, how they manage the pain. And you were saying, go ahead with that. So how, I was saying how treating lung cancer is a real team effort um, because it comes at different stages and there's different members of the team that can do different things. So you'll have the medical oncologist that might be guiding the chemotherapy. You'll have a thoracic surgeon that might be guiding the surgery that's needed, a radiation oncologist looking at the radiation and a palliative care consultant looking at the full symptom management. And nearly every case can benefit from seeing all of those different team members, mm -hmm. working out what's the best path and having a kind of team leader. If it's going to be chemotherapy, then it'd be a medical oncologist. If it's going to be radiation, it would be a radiation oncologist, but making sure that all those team members are involved because every doctor, every healthcare professional, all the nurses, they've all got different skill sets mm -hmm. and it's really making sure that you use everyone's expertise. And your skill set is? Mainly, well, chemotherapy and radiation. Okay. Um, so I'm dual trained on both sides of, uh, so if you train in the US, you tend to train in either chemotherapy or radiation. If you train in the UK, you can do both, and I end up training in both sides. Mm, uh, <laughs> um, so it keeps me busy, yeah. um, but certainly the, it helps because with 
lots of lung cancers, you'll use lots of those. You'll use radiation and you'll use chemotherapy and you'll need the palliative care support. So it's helpful to be able to know both sides. So if one, d does, the, does the patient get to choose? I mean, like chemotherapy, do they have a choice of which is less invasive or how does that work? So, yeah, sometimes there'll be a choice. There'll be a recommendation often, mm -hmm. but all doctors have to remember that ultimately it's about the patient's choice at the end of the day. And I often say to patients, it's kind of going back to the origin of the word doctor as a teacher. And now there's so much information out there mm -hmm. that it's hard to know everything. And it's about our job as doctors to understand the condition, understand the person, and then talk them through the different options. It might be that radiation can do this, chemotherapy can do that, or choosing neither, choosing to focus on living and living well and not run the risks of the side effects. They can all be different choices. And it's about understanding the good bits and the bad bits of those choices and making sure you talk it all through. So if say uh, a patient is at a stage two, going to a stage three, and they've yeah. decided to stop smoking, yeah. would that assist at that time? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So a lot of stage two and stage three lung cancers, the mainstay of their treatment is radiation. So you can still cure stage two and stage three lung cancer. Okay. And radiation does a lot of that curing. Sometimes it's surgery, often it's radiation. And actually for radiation to work most effectively, stopping smoking makes a real difference. Because okay. as the smoke goes in and it goes through the body, it changes the molecular nature of the cancer just as it goes straight past. It does something with the free radicals and the DNA. So as the radiation travels through, if you're actually smoking at the time, the cancer is more stubborn, it's more resistant to the damage that the radiation and the chemotherapy are trying to do. Mm -hmm. So even quitting at that very last moment, quitting just before you start treatment, does make a difference. It increases your chance of cure, increases your chance of responding well to the treatment. Mm -hmm. So that it's never too late. We need to say that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to yeah. quit. And so let's talk about quitting because yeah. it, it is difficult, as if, especially if you've been addicted for, in some cases, some people have been smoking since they were eight, nine years yes. old, yeah, yeah, since they were kids. So how yeah. can one really stop this smoking? So it's incredibly important to do it. And everyone's different. It's a bit like the conversation we're just having about treatment choices. Mm -hmm. um, there's not one size fits all when it comes to quitting, when it comes to quitting smoking. But as you say, it's incredibly important. We know worldwide, that smoking is the most important risk factor for cancer that we can change. So some cancers you can't do anything about, but smoking drives the most cancer deaths in the world. Oh. And if we could just stop it, mm. we'd make a huge impact. We'd make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Smoking related illnesses, which includes lung cancer, have a huge financial burden on the health system as well. So again, there's multiple, multiple ways of looking at it from the one person who by stopping smoking they may st stop themselves getting lung cancer mm -hmm. uh, to the whole system to the whole world where we just re reduce that burden of cancer death and so reduce the burden reduce that smoking yeah but then why aren't and I know this is the age-old question yeah. I know I, I guess it, it, it reduces down to the money situation yeah so anyway yeah. That's so I was at a conference over in, in Toronto back in February and we were talking about reducing cancer burden around the world and one of the conclusion was that if you're going to make a big difference, you don't just need to talk to the healthcare people, the ministers of health, you also need to talk to the minister of finance, because it's so intertwined. Um, because there's potential economic losses if you reduce the amount of smoking mm -hmm. in the short term, but huge gains in the long term. So we all know how hard it is to make those decisions where you're potentially going to pay for something up front to then make the savings da further down the line. From a patient point of view, it's save and win from the first day that you stop smoking. So are there any new uh, chemotherapy drugs out there that... that uh... Yes. So um, the treatment of lung cancer when it comes to the systemic therapies, as we now probably ought to call them, has changed dramatically again over the last five years or so. Mm -hmm. So chemotherapy actually just translates as drugs. I mean, it's obviously got its connotations and it's now being colloquialized that it means drugs for cancer and it means strong drugs for cancer. This is a lot of side effects. Yeah, and, yeah, and they are. They can be very strong and they can be very challenging. We've got now for lung cancer, because I was, as I was saying with those molecular and mutations that we can do those extra tests, you've got chemotherapy, you've got targeted therapy, and you've got immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And all of them together, we now call them systemic therapy. And they can be used in different combinations or in isolations to each other to treat the different types of lung cancer. Which one would you start off with, with a, a stage two, stage three patient? Which one would be, like we said, least, least invasive to so the body? It would depend on the, on the particular type of lung cancer. Often for the stage two, three, two and three 
because you've got a chance of cure, you're deliberately aggressive. Because your best chance to cure cancer is the first time that you try, the first time that you see it. So you'll have that conversation about putting patients through some challenging times ahead, because if we cure the cancer, then we can go back to living a normal life. And so you don't, you accept's probably not the right word, but you uh, agree that there may be some significant toxicities and side effects, and you try and work out how you're gonna manage them, how you're gonna get through them with the chemotherapy and the radiation. Because if you cure the cancer, then you've got the best chance of getting your full quality of life again. What are the chances of a, rela of a relapse with the patient? So that... it can be reasonably high for some lung cancers. Mm -hmm. um, that's why, again, sometimes there is that choice, even with a, say, a stage three, where you may say those side effects that we just talked about are too much. Right. Because you can go through all those side effects, and then you've got a 50% chance that the cancer just comes back again. And you would rather take that less aggressive approach, say some immunotherapy or targeted therapy that can have really good control but you accept he's unlikely to ever get rid of the cancer. So the immunotherapies have been the big change over the last few years, and they're very, they were first um, signed off, first authorized, first approved with lung cancer. Because, and one of the reasons they were tried in lung cancer is because some of the traditional chemotherapies really don't improve things a great deal, and they have those horrible toxicities. What immunotherapy does now is it's a medication, a drug that goes into your system, and cancers are unfortunately clever, they hide themselves from your own immune system. But what the immunotherapy does is it goes across, is it kind of shows, it sends a little signpost to the body's immune system saying there's a cancer here, go and attack it. So you can have some really impressive responses. So if your own immune system can fight your own cancer, then you have a way of having really effective treatment without as much toxicity, toxicity as the traditional chemotherapies. So that's where a lot of the research and the drive is going at the moment. And we have those immunotherapies here in Bermuda. It's not something that we miss out on just because we're in Bermuda. All right, so let's go over again. I wanted to talk about the prognosis, but we don't have much time. Okay. If you could just say a couple of words about that, and then we'll just once again go over the preventative methods for yeah. uh, not smoking. So prognosis um, is very divided. Um, if you pick up a lung cancer early, so if it's a stage one or a stage two, you've got a very good chance of curing it in the 90% region for some of the stage one cancers. Mm -hmm. Once you get to stage three, and always for stage four, it's very hard, very hard to cure. Mm -hmm. And if it's a stage four lung cancer that then doesn't respond to therapies, you know, there can be lots of different choices and it may try a therapy that should work, but it doesn't because everyone's different, then time can be really short, really challengingly short, because it's not a cancer that you can cure and they do grow quickly. That's re reality speaking. Yes, yeah. Alrighty. So uh, we only have a couple more minutes. Talk to us um, basic and everyday language, layman's terms. How can we prevent, because you're saying smoking is the number one cause of, yeah. of uh, lung cancer. So how yeah. can we prevent, I think I'm speaking to everyone, children on yeah. upwards, how can we? Yeah, so it takes a big team effort. Um, it comes from society. So if you're a parent and you're smoking and your child sees you smoke, there's a higher chance they're gonna smoke. Yeah. So it's that role model, it's taking responsibility. It's education in schools. Mm -hmm. It's education to adults. It's helping adults quit, because if you have that parent who gets a good smoking cessation program before their kid notices, then that's two or three people that you've benefited. And you said we have a smoking cessation. Yeah, so um, there's one run through the hospital. Uh, some of the GPs run smoking cessation as well, and the open airways, the asthma group help guide to different areas. So there's a number of options available. They're all tailored to slightly different uh, groups of people. So some of them are based on group therapy, others have more medical management. Um, so I think the best starting point, if you're sat there listening to this, watching this, and you think, I, I should really stop, then talk to your GP. That's, That's the, the first step. Yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. Um, yeah. Any final words we're about to actually finish out? No, I mean, it's just everyone has control over their health. There's some things you can't change, but smoking is one thing you can change. So it's about taking responsibility and doing your best to stop. And if you're struggling to stop, get some help. All right. Nicely said. <laughs> All right. And we want to thank Dr. Fosca for taking time out of his busy schedule to share information on this vital subject matter. Having healthy lungs maintains quality of life. So we have to do what we can to safeguard that. On behalf of our team here at Health and Family, I'm Shay Joan Burgess. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.